we're going to talk this morning about a subject the Lord gave me weeks ago for this house. Uh, I was sitting on my back porch reading scripture, and, and I read in three different translations every day to, to get different flavors of what the Lord is doing. I switch them around. Sometimes I'll be in the Passion, sometimes in the Message, sometimes in the NIV, sometimes in the ESV. I'll read an Old Testament passage in one translation and a New Testament passage in another. And I was reading in the Passion Translation. And I want, uh, you guys would throw up Hebrews chapter 10, first of all, in the NIV. I want to read something to you, and then I want to tell you what came alive for me. And I believe it's a message for us here as we try to live our name and be people of hope. This is Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. Now I want you to hear it in the Passion Translation. So don't lose your bold, courageous faith. For you are destined for a great reward. Let this part sink in. You need the strength of endurance to reveal the poetry of God's will. And then you receive the promise in full. Papa, I thank you for this house. I love this house. Thank you for the way they've opened their hands, their arms to Diane and I and our family. I thank you for our pastors. For the years I've been able to watch their faithfulness. Roger, Angel, Dory, Kent, Shay. I thank you for what they've modeled to this house, and I thank you that they've had a house receptive to the model who have said yes. I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you come today as the spirit of encouragement and that you stir a fire within us that we will endure until we hear the poetry of your will and receive the fullness of your promise. I ask this for the sake of the one who is worth it. Amen. Amen. Thomas Edison once said that many of life's greatest failures are people that did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. This is a true story. There's a guy named R.U. Darby. He was an insurance salesman. He and his uncle got, a, uh, got bit by the gold fever back in the gold rush days, left Maryland, went to Colorado, staked a claim, dug in the ground, and found gold. And they were so surprised by what they found when they sent it off that they realized they had landed on a massive gold vein. So they went back to Maryland, borrowed money from everybody they knew, bought machinery that they would need to dig it out of the ground, went back. The first, the first box car of, coal, of ore that they got, they sent off, and it was considered the richest find in Colorado. They knew with just a few more cars, they would have paid off all those machines, and then it would be pennies from heaven from then on. Except something happened. The gold disappeared. They kept digging and digging and digging exactly where they were before, and the gold was gone. They couldn't find it anywhere. They digged till they ran out of hope, till they ran out of money, till they ran out of energy, and they finally quit. Sold all the machinery to a junk salesman for pennies on the dollar. But the junk salesman was no fool because he knew that gold still had to be there somewhere. So he brought in an engineer. They studied the territory. The engineer figured it out, told him where to dig. They dug. First time they dug, they dug up gold. That junk man became a multiple millionaire. Digging three feet from where the previous owners quit. Three feet. Anytime that you are waiting for God on something significant, Shay, 
There will be the temptation, almost irresistible, to give up when it gets really hard. In fact, there is a trifecta of defeat. Disappointment leads to discouragement, which releases disillusionment. And when that happens, we throw in the towel. We stop. We quit. It doesn't matter if you're believing for healing, provision for our building here, for revival in the region. It doesn't matter what you're waiting on. If you're waiting on a kingdom level thing, you can bet that at some point in time, the tunnel that you're in will feel like a cave. And if you sit down in it, it doesn't matter that there's a way out on the other end. You've turned it into a cave. You see, the enemy of our souls has this great desire to short-circuit the purpose of God that is in your life. Before you were born, God had a dream and He slapped your name on it. And He said, I want to bring this into the earth. And every person is designed and destined to do something significant for the kingdom. It's not all the same size. It doesn't look all the same. But there's not a person here who is advanced pawn scum. There is not a person here who God didn't have a reason for you to be here. And not only for you to be here, but for you to be here in this house with these people. And it is the obsession of the enemy's soul to defeat that dream. The worst thing you can do to hell is allow the dream of God to come true in your life. And so all of hell is bent, obsessed with stopping you between the dreaming and the coming true. Here's one of the ways he does it. The devil wants you to think there's nothing more permanent than the temporary situation you are in. You're right in the middle of it. Pain, questions, fears, sickness, loss, lack of provision. It doesn't matter what it is. You're right in the middle of it. And he wants to convince you that where you are is where you're going. But listen, this whole thing of following Jesus isn't about getting somewhere. It's about becoming something. Destination is where you're going. Destiny is what you become on the way. And so the enemy will do everything he can to get you to quit. That's why the greatest spiritual weapon you have in your arsenal is show up and show out. Just show up and show out. He doesn't have an answer for that. Charlie Pam, he doesn't have an answer for what you guys did yesterday. He he literally sat in this place going, what is that? Look at those crazy people. They love Jesus in spite of the questions, in spite of the pain. He has no answer for that. That's why the hardest times require the greatest hope, Pastor. Listen, it's what I've come to call the invincible power of the yet mindset. It's full, the Bible's full of it. It's full of people who right in the middle of the worst circumstance of their life find this soul-shifting, life-sustaining, trajectory-altering, atmosphere-shifting Three-letter word. Yet. David had it. In the worst moments of his woundedness, this is what he said, Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. you ever feel that? Yet, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Job had it. In the time of literally incalculable loss, where he goes from having everything to having nothing except a wife he didn't have. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. And you know what he goes on to say? This will work for my deliverance. 
Jeremiah had it. Jeremiah was at a period in his life where all he could do was weep. He literally wept out the Word of God we call lamentation. Listen to what he says. I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is, so I say my splendor is gone. And all that I had hoped for from the Lord, I remember my affliction, my wondering, the bitterness, and the gall. I remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great! is your faithfulness. Habakkuk understood it. In the crucible of his unanswered questions, he literally stood before God with a pile of why and how long. Read it. He stands there with the questions. And he says, though the fig tree does not blossom and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pens and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Paul understood it. In moments of his greatest felt weakness, he whispered this from his soul. Here's why we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, Yet, inwardly, we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. Even Jesus felt it. Standing and looking at his friends that he'd walked with for three years, he prophesied their betrayal. Time is coming, and in fact, has now come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. It's the power of the yet mindset. It is, is, according to the author of Hebrews, what I read to you a little bit while ago, it's the secret, it's the key to being able to Keep going in the midst of everything that says stop because you know that if I make it through this, something on the other side will make it worth it. He gave it a word. He gave it a name. Endurance. Many of the translations said you have need of endurance. You know, we think of endurance as, oh, Just enduring this. That's not what the word means. It's a compound word in the original language that means under and to stand. To stand under. Think about how we try to reverse that. We want to understand. He wants us to stand under. And it's got more than that to it. It actually has an element to it that you stand under the pressure, but you are not shaped by it. I have this this image, this picture of the enemy taking you and putting you in his forge of fire and putting on the squeeze. He's got you in his mold. He's heated it up. And he's squeezing. And he squeezes. And he squeezes. And then he, he looks at hell and he goes, oh, we're going to distort them so badly. We're going to distort them and they're going to define themselves by this pain. And then all of a sudden he opens the mold and you know what he sees? The image of Jesus. And all of hell says, I don't think that's what he meant to do. Endurance makes two declarations. I will not let pressure warp my sense of who I am. It will not destroy my destiny. 
What I'm going through is not who I am. It will not define me. It will not limit me. It will not put boundaries around me. It will not paint me for the rest of my life. Second declaration. I will not let my pain distort my understanding of Him. He is good. And His mercy endures forever. If there's anything pain wants to do is cause you to define yourself by what you're going through or to distort the image of God into believing it's His fault. Endurance says I refuse to be defined by what I'm going through. Hey, listen, I want to talk to some of you that have a past. Some of you got a past, though. You don't just have a past, you have a past. Am I talking to somebody in the house? Lots of people have a past. I have a past. See? And what the enemy wants to do is define you by your past, by the worst moments of your life, by the worst chapters in your narrative. He can't do it because the author and finisher of your faith already wrote the beginning, middle, and end, Kent. He doesn't get to define me because somebody greater already did. Refuse to allow difficult circumstance, baffling questions, inexplicable mysteries, or undeniable delays define who you are. Don't let the dark, the difficult, the disorienting stuff of life tell you who you are or tell you who God is. We live in a broken world. It's going to get ugly sometimes. The Savior of our souls says, in this world, you will have trouble. We love to quote the promises of God, but I've never heard a worship song written out of that one. In this world, you'll have trouble. In this world, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. But it's a promise. But it's a promise with a comma. In this world, you will have trouble. But don't be afraid. I have overcome. You see, Jesus himself demonstrated the most fundamental principle of endurance. If you don't hear anything else I say, listen to this. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2, 3. It's that beautiful story of of the cloud of witnesses that is around us. And it says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Listen, for the joy set before him he endured for the joy set before him he endured the cross despising its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of god consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart don't give up three feet too soon Jesus, you see, for the joy set before him endured. Here it is. If you can see through it, you will see it through. If you can see through it, you will see it through. For the joy set before him, he endured. You ask, how do people make it? They've seen through it. They've seen through it. They've seen through the fog of the pain. They've seen through the fog of the discouragement and disappointment. They've seen through the fog of circumstance. And on the other side of that, there is the poetry of His will. 
It's when all the disparate threads of thought that didn't look like they were connected suddenly come together and you begin to see the rhyme and rhythm and reason of the great poet as he has written your story that you didn't even think was a story. Because he's not writing a story, he's writing a song. I went back through this little passage a few verses before, and I said, God, I need, I need something for us to hang our hats on. We get the idea. How do we do this? I want to give you four things that the author of Hebrews says here. I want you to write them down. You're going to need these at some point in your life. How do you keep standing? How do you not quit three feet too soon? One, you have to remember, you have a source within you. Verse 19 to 22, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is His body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having bodies washed with the pure water. Listen to this. Because of the finished work of Jesus, because of His blood, and the fact that He stands dripping that blood at the throne of God, we can approach Him confidently. See, The one who broke down the dam that separated us from God opened a river inside of you. You have a source within you. And when times get hard, you have to go down deep into that well. When, when, the, when, the, when the situation you're in excavates deep caverns in your soul, let God fill them with the water of life. You see, endurance is stoked by intimacy. I I know I can make it because I know Him. You know, that's what this book is about. This book is so full of stories of real people in real situations. I'm telling you, if I wrote a book that was supposed to build up my reputation, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here I'd have left out. And there, there's a whole bunch of people in here I wouldn't have included their biographies. Because I'm looking at God saying, you got some really bad friends, you know, in the book. you you hanging around with some real losers. Read the stories, guys. Be honest with it. You know, we like to gloss them over. Those people went through some stuff. But listen to Romans 15, 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach you so that through endurance taught in the Scripture and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Every time I look at myself and I think I'm such a mess, I go back in the book and look for somebody messier. You know what I mean? Thank God that you might be dumb, but there's always dumber in the book. It is. It's true. Time I say something stupid to God, I have to go read Peter. Like, I look at God and say, I know that was stupid, but you, you, Peter, just Peter. The second thing, you have brothers beside you you know Kelsey what you did this morning having these people come up and testify is literally what I'm talking about here people ask me sometimes why do you keep talking about all the pain of 23 years ago in your life when you you did such horrible things and you nearly destroyed you why do you keep talking about it God delivered you you're free because somebody in the house always needs to hear Somebody that's wounded needs to see scars that have healed. Your story matters. Listen to this, verse 23. 
Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Endurance is supported by camaraderie. You know, every time I, every time I get around these two, and I know some of what they've been through, there's encouragement. You made it. You made it. Kent, Shay, you made it. You didn't get shot in Africa. Close. See, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What He did for someone else, He can do it again. So when you're going through that really hard time, understand, we not only have the book of stories, we have the book of stories. Because God didn't write a book and go mute. He didn't stop writing here. He's still writing the story of the Culvers. And we all get to stand in that with them and get the hope of our calling from those who are prisoners of hope. Third thing. And this one's a warning from the Scripture. You have treasures before you. In the middle of all of this encouragement that He's given them to have endurance and how if they make it through, God's promise will be fulfilled. Listen to what He says. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, verse 26, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only the fearful expectation of judgment and raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and who has treated as unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? What he's saying is you carry treasure. You have the treasure of God's presence. You have the treasure of God's Word. You have the treasure of God's family. And, and when you decide that you can't take it anymore, and you decide to quit, you've given in to the enemy's desire to devalue the eternal that God has given you. It's like you take the treasures of God and throw them on the ground. And this is what you're saying. It's not worth it. As growing up, we used to sing a gospel song. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. There may not be a time in my life when I can honestly say everything we've been through is worth it. There are times now that we look back and we say, boy, we're thankful for what God brought us through and he, He's done so much for us, but I can't always look back without some regret. But there will be a time when regret is no longer possible because I'm seeing His face. I'm living in His grace. I have Him forever. Endurance is solidified by fidelity. He is faithful. We need to be faithful. I, I think too often we don't have enough Ebenezers in our congregation. Now I know some of you are going to go out and have babies and name them Ebenezer. That's not what it meant. <laughs> Ebenezer was what God told the people of Israel after one particular victory to raise up so that their sons and their daughters and generations to come could hear this testimony. Up to this point, hitherto, the Lord has helped us. We need more Ebenezers. You know why? Because when you get pushed back, when you get pushed back, at some point, 
uh, you get up against the Ebenezer and he can't push you no more. Why? Because I won here before. God brought me to this point before. Brings me to the last one. You have victories behind you. I love this last part. He gets tender after that moment of confrontation and he says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution at other times you stood side by side with those who were mistreated you suffered along with those in prison joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession so do not throw away your confidence it will be richly rewarded. Think about this. This is these phrases. When you endured, do you remember the early days when you endured because you knew? You remember it? Remember the crazy stuff you went through when you were young in Jesus? And it didn't matter because you knew? And sometimes the farther we get from those early days, the less we know. You have victories behind you. You have won before. You know what he's saying? Guys, don't give up. You've done the hard stuff already. You've already done the hard stuff. Endurance is sustained by testimony. Here's where it gets really good for me. Verse 39. We do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. You know what I hear him saying? Look, guys, you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you receive the promise. And I want to remind you of something. In our family, we don't quit. That's what he's saying. We're not of those that shrink back. We don't quit. Hope, in our family, we don't quit. We don't stop three feet short of the gold. We keep digging. We keep looking. We keep believing. He said, we're not of those that shrink back and are destroyed. We are of those who push forward in faith and are saved. Romans 5, 3-5. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, endurance. Endurance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. You will never be sorry you believed Him. That's the yet mindset. I want to take you back now to that verse that started the whole thinking. He said, you have need of perseverance to see the poetry of God's will. That word in the original language is, is akin to the word in Ephesians 2.10. You are His poetry. You are His song. He wants to sing you. You see, He said... You're going to see the poetry of God's will. Some people have the idea that God's will is that hard thing God wants you to do that you don't want to do. It's the Garden of Gethsemane picture. Your, your will be done. Go ahead, kill me, God. You know, That's how people view the will of God. But in the, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the word will, it has these three pieces sewn together inseparably. Desire, design, and delight. 
The will of God is His desire for you that He has designed you to accomplish. And when you do it, He's delighted to see that. That's the will of God. And he said, you're going through a time now where it seems like all the phrases are frayed and it it looks like a word cloud, not a poem. And and, and he said, you don't want to quit in the middle of it because you'll miss the reveal. Where God's will, His song, His poetry is released into the ages. And he said, then you will receive the full promise. See, God is writing a tune in your name. A song from your story. A poem from the pressure and the pain. He never ends the song without a resolved chord. You musicians just got that, I know. He never ends the song on a major fourth. He always resolves the song to a conclusion where everyone can say, Amen. So I'm going to challenge you this morning, Hope. I know we've been through some stuff. Congregation. Had a few too many of those memorial services. Had a few unanswered prayers. And the irresistible temptation is to quit. Three feet short of the gold. But he says you have need of perseverance. Stand under the pressure, but don't let it shape you. Stand under it. That's what he meant when he said, get all your armor on, and when you've done everything, just stand there. Just just stand there. Don't be shaped. Don't let what you're going through define you. Don't let it distort your understanding of God. Because the reality is, He's finishing the song. And you know what will happen one day? He's going to take your melody and your harmony and yours and yours and yours and yours and He's going to turn it into a symphony. It's called the Song of the Redeemed. And it's the only time heaven ever gets silent. The angels can't sing along because they don't know the song. It's played on your pain. It's strummed through your perplexity. It sounds through your questions. It it echoes through your fears. It is the song of the redeemed. It is the voice from every tongue and tribe and nation. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. 